Thank you for inviting me um, to this event. I, I'm here um, to speak about a book called The Flip, um, which in the American edition is subtitled Epiphanies of Mind and the Future of Knowledge. And, th and that's really what I want to talk about. It came out in 2018. Um, I wrote the book because of, a, of an editor named Erica Goldman, just to kind of give you some background. I think, I think the background of the book is very significant. I wrote an essay in the Chronicle of Higher Education called Visions of the Impossible. And it really dealt with what I think most people think of as paranormal phenomena, precognitive dreams and telepathic experiences and near-death experiences, this kind of thing. And I wrote it in what's essentially the New York Times of the higher educational world. And Erica described herself as a, um, a skeptical of, of all of these materials, but she couldn't find anything in the essay she could disagree with. And so she she pushed me to write this book, which I wrote. I wrote for her. It has five chapters, and it kind of goes through where I think the philosophy of mind or where lots of people are saying now about consciousness, where where it's at at the moment, and how how paranormal experiences are really relevant to this, this area. Um, and so that's why I wrote the book. And I also wrote the book because it's about scientists and engineers and medical professionals, by the way. My my students at Rice University are primarily STEM. They're not they're not studying history or philosophy. They're studying science or technology or engineering or mathematics. And it took me a while. I've been here since 02, so I've been here 22 years. It took me a while to realize that if I use a lot of classical religious texts, these young people immediately dismiss them because they say in their head something like, well, so-and-so didn't know their science or their evolutionary biology or their physics. And so they had, they say these ridiculous things. And so what I did in the flip is I called on computer scientists and engineers and physicists, and I showed that they have the same kinds of experiences. It, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you live in the 14th century or the 21st or, or now the 21st, I guess. You still People still have these sorts of experiences and people still can think with them. And what I mean by the flip is that someone like an engineer or a medical doctor is trained in a materialist, physicalist mode of thinking that everything is essentially dead matter that works through mathematical relations and can be measured and quantified and manipulated and they have some kind of experience it might be on a psychedelic it might be a near-death experience it might be that their sister just telepathically knew instantly when they were in an accident but something in their lives flips them and they then take this position that consciousness or subjectivity is primary and the material world is actually somehow emanated from that that subjective or or mental or conscious imbued reality, and they realize that their science and engineering doesn't suffer at all. In fact, it might get better. Um, so they realize that the the science or the engineering is not the same thing as the philosophy of materialism. To to kind of put it in a nutshell. They realize that there's different metaphysical interpretations of reality and that they really matter um, and, th and that they depend on one's states of consciousness. And if you've had the virtue or the, the unvirtue of entering an altered state, you know that reality is not maybe what the rest of people think it is. And that, that's really the basis of the flip. Um, what I want to do today is I want to read you a very short paper. Um, and as I think some of you heard me say earlier, I, I learned early on in my career, you know, like 30 years ago, to read papers and not to talk like this because I want to put some cer certain ideas on the table. Um, and so I'm going to just read you these four or five pages and then we can open it up uh, and have a conversation with, with Daniel and, and everyone who's online here. Okay, so let, let me let me put these ideas on the table and then we can talk about them. These are essentially bets or wagers that I learned to call them. In other words, they're hypotheses. I do not have certainties. 
there is one very general ontological or metaphysical wager about what reality is like. And then there are four more specific ones that are more speculative and perhaps for some of you a bit more wild. My most general intellectual wager is that the total reality or gestalt gleaned or intuited from comparative mystical literature, which is my own specialty, strongly suggests that consciousness and the cosmos are two modes or expressions of the same fundamental reality, manifesting in us as knowing and experiencing subjects. The world is one with a capital O, although it becomes two in our experiences when we split up that reality in our knowing and sensing that is, when we become human subjects and are socialized into various reigning worldviews and identities. And so what I'm trying to say here is that reality appears to be have both a mental and a material dimension to it because we are who we are. We're, we're the ones splitting up reality. And reality, that interiority and that that exteriority are the same, are the same basic basic reality. We don't do this consciously or intentionally, much less do we do this as individuals. We do this by virtue of being born into a specific body, language, family, and community, and becoming socialized subjects or persons who know physical objects. That is, who split the world up into two basic dimensions of experience again, the mental and the material, the cultural and the natural. Maybe this is why I'm so... I guess, so suspicious of personal immortality. I think the person is, is part of this, the splitting up. Reality always remains something other or more and it's ground, but it also becomes all of the things, egos and cultural worlds that we know and believe up here. Reality is one, but it is also and really becomes two. In short, I lean strongly to some sort of monistic picture in a dual aspect mode. I have employed this ontology in my published work to understand what I call the impossible as a meaningful collapse of the subject object epistemological structure that is as a temporary revelation of the dual aspect monistic nature of reality. Let, let me explain that. I take paranormal experiences very seriously because I think these are moments in a human life where the subject and the object are collapsing. So people are experiencing the environment as reflective of their inner states and their inner states are somehow um, affecting or, or, or emanating the physical reality. And I think those are very significant. It is my opinion or my wager that such paradoxical phenomena are anything but philosophical fluff or neurological blips. They're not, they're not accidents. They are important signs on the forest floor pointing to a cosmos that is profoundly connected, that is one world in which something like precognitive dreams become entirely possible. This partial or complete collapse of the subject-object, known partly and darkly in impossible events and more fully and directly in full-blown mystical experiences, points to one of what I want to call the future of knowledge. So I think this is the future of knowledge, that that consciousness and the cosmos are the same thing. If such a future of knowledge strikes you as too friendly to the gorilla of religion in our living room, allow me to remind you that modern science and technology have not somehow eliminated modern people's spiritual sensibilities. Quite the contrary, they have been wildly productive of new spiritual ideas and expressions. Think the near death or psychedelic literatures or the ever-increasing literature on the philosophy of quantum physics, which would not have happened without the advances of biomedical technology, modern chemistry, and of course, quantum physics itself. So I think, I think modern ways of, of being spiritual, in fact, rely on the sciences, and the sciences have not eliminated people's spiritual potentials. Nor would have such modern literatures, the psychedelic and the near-death literature, happen without the central role of the scientists themselves. 
the quantum philosophy literature, for example, <laughs> was not born in the counterculture in the 1960s or by new age enthusiasts in the 1980s. It was born at the beginning of quantum mechanics in founding figures like Schrodinger, Bohr, and Pauli, each of whom saw the profound philosophical parallels, not identities, that resonate between these different forms of human experience and expression, the mathematical and the mystical. So all these, all of these uh, quantum physicists, Schrodinger, Bohr, and Pali, turned immediately to mystical and parapsychological literature for parallels up here in human experience for the quantum base of reality down here, as it were. The religious imagination and its powers then have always been at work behind the secular scenes within a kind of esoteric history of science, a forbidden science, as the computer and information scientist Jacques Vallée has named the venture in his published journals. It is time to acknowledge this fuller history of science, science not as imagined or proclaimed by a few elite dogmatic physicalists, but is actually practiced and lived on the ground and in the metaphysical closet. It is also time for the humanities to adopt much more radical modes of historiography and human being, models that are in tune with what we are currently suspecting about the nature of space-time, <laughs> that it is that it can be bent and curved, even turned back on itself, the time does not flow in just one direction. Can you imagine what a writing of history that took precognitive phenomena as historical facts might look like? <clears throat> Can you imagine what we might look like? I pretend no pure objectivity here. Indeed, for philosophical reasons I have already hinted at, I would deny both the autonomy of a purely objective material realm and consequently the ideal ideal of objectivity as such, as an adequate final stance. I don't actually believe in pure objectivity. Objectivity is a half-truth, so is subjectivity. I speak just below or just above both out of a clear conviction that the future of knowledge will come when we are able to see through both as temporary effects of our own existence, as subjects perceiving an apparently objective world and move out of this splitting into a more fundamental ground that preceded our own existence and will remain long after we as little egos are no more. The face we had before we were born to invoke a Zen riddle. My present thought spins out of this double denial of the subject and the object as it takes up the faceless face of the paradoxical impossible. Understood now not as some kind of superstitious detritus to leave behind, much less, as, much less as the stuff of tabloids and rumor, but as a temporary collapse of the subject-object split that we and the physical universe seem to be. Need I add that such a collapse is no small thing, that it is the sign still rejected of the very future of knowledge, which is also to say the future us. <clears throat> 